Welcome. Uh, we're about to begin here in number nine of our 173rd uh, session. The title of the hearing is Case 12.958, Russell Bogleu versus uh, the U.S. And this is a hearing requested by American uh, Civil Liberties Union. And we thank here the presence of petitioners and representatives of the state. Uh, as you all know, uh, the methodology of our hearing begins with a presentation of uh, 15 minutes by the petitioners. Then we will uh, have uh, 15 minutes to the representatives of the state. The, the, this podium uh, will have 10 minutes to present questions and then both parties uh, will make a, a final re a remarks uh, with the time available. With, um, let me introduce the members of this uh, uh, podium. Um, together with me, um, Commissioner Margaret May McCauley. Uh, she is present at this hearing in her capacity of rapporteur for the US. Um, also here present is um, um, the, the executive, uh, the assistant executive secretary, Madame uh, Maria Claudia Pulido. Uh, in any moment, uh, I, I, my colleague, Commissioner Flavia Piovesan, will come to the to the podium. And I also recognize the presence of Fernando Dos Anjos, who is the chief of cabinet of the executive secretary. Um, I will be very strict with the with time. Uh, we are running late, so please bear with me. Uh, I will be raising these flags as time is uh, approaching to an end. And when I put the flags upside down, that means the time is finished and we have to conclude. Sorry about that, but uh, I really have to catch up with this uh, uh, delay. Uh, without any, any further comment, I will start our hearing with the presentation by the applicants. You have the floor. Good afternoon, distinguished commissioners. My name is Jamil Dakwar, and I'm the director of the ACLU Human Rights Program. First, I would like to introduce our delegation. On my right side in sitting order, Mr. Jeremy Weiss, counsel for Mr. Baklu, Ms. Cassandra Stubbs, director of the ACLU Capital Punishment Project, and Ms. Megan McCracken, con contract attorney with the ACLU Capital Punishment Project and national expert on lethal injections. We thank you for holding this exceptional and unprecedented life or death hearing, or more accurately, life or torture to death hearing. This hearing is literally Baklu's last opportunity to plead for immediate actions to prevent his torturous execution scheduled for next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Missouri local time. To, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first ever hearing in which prisoners sentenced to death will have the opportunity to demand accountability for violation of his rights and to appeal for clemency so as to implement the commission's recommendations while facing imminent execution. While we are pleased that the US government is represented at this hearing, we are deeply disappointed that the real decision makers who have the power to take action and implement the commission recommendations are absent. Their no-show today is an abdication of responsibility to uphold human rights and above all the right to life and freedom from torture. This commission has been apprised of Baklu's case since 2014. It issued precautionary measures on May 20th, 2014, just two days before his execution was stayed by the US Supreme Court. The commission issued its final merits report on May 10th, 2018, two months after, after the US Supreme Court stayed Baklu's execution for the second time. As we explain in our written submission, the US Supreme Court reaffirmed the use of a judicial standard that runs contrary to the merits report's recommendations, placing a remarkably high burden on any current or future prisoners attempting to challenge the compliance of their state's method of execution with the constitutional and human rights standards against torturous execution. Furthermore, the lethal injection protocol used in Missouri alongside Baklu's worsening medical condition, as will be described in more detail by my colleague, together pose a significant risk of botched execution, which is really almost near certainty, effectively ensuring a horrifying, extremely painful, bloody, and gruesome death. This is preventable. 
and Governor Parson, governor of Missouri, has the power to prevent this act at the, at the stroke of a pen. Should Governor Parson choose to do the right thing, he would avoid the grave responsibility of allowing gruesome and torturous execution and would bring Missouri into conformity with international human rights obligations consistent with the commission's recommendations. Since neither the US federal government nor the state of Missouri can provide guarantees that Baklu's execution would not violate internationally recognized human rights, especially the absolute prohibition against torture, granting Baklu's clemency and commuting his sentence to life without parole is the only outcome that would not stay in the United States Constitution and international law. While international law does not prohibit capital punishment per se, although there is an evolving um, a tendency to, towards abolition, nor all forms of lethal injections, it does not prohibit any execution method that constitutes torture or CIDT. And in assessing whether a given practice amounts to torture or CIDT, international law takes into account the particular char characteristics of the individual affected. As the commission stated, suffocation in one's own blood for four minutes until one dies certainly qualifies as torture or cruel inhumane degrading treatment or punishment. And as such is absolutely prohibited by international law. International law also supports the commission's finding of placing the burden of proving a non-cruel method of execution on the state rather on the defendant. Moreover, International law imposes an affirmative obligation to states to prevent torture or cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. Not only has the state of Missouri failed to identify a non-torturous way to execute Mr. Bucklew, but if Governor Parson allows Mr. Bucklew's execution, the state will likely become complicit in perpetuating an act of torture, no less. More than or nearly 60,000 people have signed a petition put forward by the ACLU and Missourians against the death penalty, calling on Governor Parson to commute Baklu's death sentence. While Baklu committed, has committed horrible crimes for which he has been very remorseful, his life should not end in torturous execution in gross violations of international law. We call on you to add your voice and hold the United States and the state of Missouri accountable and urge Governor Parson to commute Baklu's death sentence. I will turn now to my colleague, Jeremy. Thank you, um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my client, uh, Russell Bucklew, who sits um, at the Potosi Correctional Center in Missouri awaiting an October 1 execution. I'm going to provide you with an update uh, on his medical condition as it stands today, information that we didn't have um, when this commission last uh, considered his case as well as talk a little bit about the mitigation of punishment that wasn't available to the jury and frankly wasn't available to any of the courts until uh, recently. First off with his medical condition as the Commission knows he has cavernous hemangioma. This is a lifelong condition that causes tumors to grow in his head, neck um, and face. Those con tumors continue to progress. They're inoperable and cause him uh, considerable pain and discomfort as well as impact um, basic life functions such as breathing and swallowing. In June of uh, 2018 after the March 20th uh, execution date passed and before the U.S. Supreme Court heard his case, uh, he uh, contracted meningitis while at the Potosi Correctional Center. He was sent to a local hospital, uh, sent back after he was misdiagnosed and uh, his condition uh, worsened to the point that he had to be um, transported under an emergency fashion to Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. He was, uh, they undertook life-saving procedures and ultimately saved his life. In doing so, they inserted a tracheostomy, um, a six centimeter trache tracheostomy, millimeter, excuse me, uh, tracheotomy in his uh, neck in order to allow him to breathe. That remains there today. Um, it is uh, based on the determination of our expert, Dr. Joel Zibbett, who uh, examined him on Friday, September 20th, that that uh, trach is necessary for him to continue to breathe and uh, in order to, um, it is life sustaining for him. The tracheotomy um, actually causes some issues uh, and, and, and doesn't solve uh, the 
the lethal injection concerns um, for the state of Missouri. It's a narrow tube, has to be cleaned on a daily basis, and um, is easily subject to clogging and or obstruction. When it is obstructed, he chokes and has um, difficulty breathing and had to, as late as two days ago, declare a medical emergency in order to have it cleaned because uh, he received, um, he hadn't had it cleaned by the officials at Potosi Correctional Center. What we, what we expect um, and what our expert expects to occur during the course of the um, Missouri protocol is for him to continue to bleed from the uh, tumors that are in his mouth, uh, neck, and throat. Those bleed on a daily basis. They cause him difficulty in his ability to swallow. In fact, he has to regulate his uh, swallowing. Uh, in a way that he has to think about it and he has to regulate the amount of liquid or solids that he can ingest at any one time. That will be compromised by the uh, stress and anxiety of the execution protocol itself, combined with the fact that he will be strapped down to a gurney, unable to move his um, uh, head or arms in order to help himself breathe or dislodge any um, obstructions. We think that uh, is absolutely going to occur and that that process will not only be, will represent torture for Mr. Bucklew because he is likely to um, choke on his own <coughs> blood and saliva, but we also believe it will be a horrifying and gruesome spectacle for those unfortunate enough to have to attend, either be uh, witnesses for the victim's family, witnesses for Mr. Bucklew, and certainly, uh, we'll, we expect that they will be documented by the news media present for the execution itself. That can be stopped um, with intervention by uh, Governor Parsons. Mitigation evidence is also important in this case, and it's information that the jury didn't have. The jury based its decision in part on uh, facts that were, or, or beliefs that were just wrong and presented by the defense. One is that um, the defense expert hired by his court-appointed counsel, said that he had, um, was antisocial personality disorder, in other words, a sociopath. That um, was wrong. Dr. Harry, who gave that uh, testimony at trial, now says it was wrong. It was wrong because he didn't have the information necessary to make a proper diagnosis. That information was, or should have been, supplied by his lawyers. But because they didn't uh, conduct an adequate examination or an investigation into his case at the time, they didn't give him all the information necessary to make a competent uh, recommendation. And when they, when he did that, and when he gave that information to the prosecutor, the prosecutor ran with it and rightfully said, from their perspective, that this is a person that cares not about anyone else, cares only about himself, and presents an ongoing danger to himself and others. In fact, that's one of the things that he argued in closing statements to the jury, that you cannot give Mr. Bucklew a life imprisonment sentence because he will pose a harm to other corrections officers and other inmates. But we now know we have 23 years of history with Mr. Bucklew in the Department of Corrections, and his history is exemplary. He has had not one single fight. He has not been involved in a level one altercation at any time in his 23 years. And that's not our documentation, that's documentation by the Missouri officials. So we now know that one of the bases for uh, the jury's determination that he is a uh, unrepentant sociopath that is, will be a harm to others is just not true. One of the other things that uh, the court and the prosecutors relied on was the lack of basic mitigation um, as it related to his family. Both Mr. Bucklew's parents um, testified during the mitigation phase that they loved their son, that he would be um, a valued member of their family where he allowed, where he allowed to live. Um, but they talked in glowing terms about their family and the environment in which he grew up in. While they have a lovely family, that family is not without concerns and issues. But those issues were never... Um, demonstrated or spelled out to the jury, and that's because the trial lawyers didn't do an investigation. What we learned is that Mr. Bucklew is, rather than being a, uh, an outlier or a black sheep within the family as he was described, 
he is a product of a family. He is a product of multi-generational um, substance abuse, um, issues with infidelity within the family, uh, violence that he was subjected to on a repeated basis by family. Um, none of that came out at trial. That doesn't excuse his behavior on the day of the crime, but it does contextualize it. Most importantly, at the end, uh, Mr. Bucklew had a severe opioid addiction at the time, all prescribed due to the cavernous hemangiomas he was being treated by medical professionals, and those medical professionals gave him a significant number of opioids, an amount that probably would not be given today given what we know about opioid addiction and the use of opioids. But beginning, it wasn't until that addiction took over and his, um, that his addiction took over that he started having problems. He wasn't a perfect kid, um, but he didn't have significant issues, uh, never had significant issues with the law. And he was, at the time he was arrested and the time the crime was committed, deeply impacted by his opioid addiction. His, uh, he weighed 95 pounds at the time that he was arrested. Um, his family believed he was going to die. They all came in from out of town to say their, their last goodbyes to him. He has not been on opioids when he's been in the Department of Corrections system. And as I pointed out before, his uh, prison record is exemplary. There is a direct tie to his behavior and the conduct as being an outlier as a result of his opioid addiction. Um, and we think that is significant. That's information the jury was never able to consider when they decided to recommend a, a sentence of death. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you for your statement. Um, can I hear now uh, the presentation of the state, please? 15 minutes. Absolutely. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished commissioners, secretariat colleagues, and friends at the other table. My name is Alexis Ludwig. I'm the deputy permanent representative at the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. And it's an honor to be here with you today and to reiterate our support for the important work that you all do in this hemisphere. I'd also like to take this opportunity to emphasize that the United States is one of the strongest supporters of the important work that the Commission does across the Americas. And we'd also like to make a, a, a note that at the outset that the petitioner's request for this hearing and the Commission's invitation to participate today was forwarded to the state of Missouri. But now for the, a more legal argument, I'm going to turn it over to Thomas Weatherall from the State Department's legal uh, division. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Alexis. Um, and thank you, distinguished commission, petitioners, the other table. Yes, once again, my name is Thomas Weatherall, and I'm an attorney advisor with the U.S. Department of State. Mr. Buckley was sentenced to death in the state of Missouri for first-degree murder on May 19, 1997, after a jury trial. As has been well documented in the proceedings before the commission, petitioner pursued various modes of appeal and ultimately joined suit with other death row inmates challenging Missouri's lethal injection protocol. The Commission issued precautionary measures in March 2018 and a merits report in May 2018, while Petitioner continued to litigate his case in the United States. The Commission found in its merits report that Petitioner was denied judicial remedy in the context of the application of lethal injection as the method of execution. This finding is refuted by the procedural history of Petitioner's case. After granting a stay of execution for Petitioner on March 20, 2018, the Supreme Court of the United States granted a petition for writ of certiorari on April 30th, 2018, in order to examine questions related to the method of execution at issue in this case. The Supreme Court heard petitioner's case and rendered its decision on April 1, 2019. The fact that the commission rendered a merits report while petitioner continued to exhaust his domestic remedies on the very same subject matter as contained in the petition is inconsistent with the requirements of Article 31 of the Commission's Rules of Procedure. Article 31.1 of the Rules of Procedure states that, quote, in order to decide on the admissibility of a matter, the Commission shall verify whether the remedies of the domestic legal system have been pursued and exhausted in accordance with the generally recognized principles of international law. As the Commission is aware, this provision of the rules is based on the general requirement of exhaustion of domestic remedies as a means of ensuring the international proceedings respect state sovereignty. The requirement of exhaustion ensures that the state having jurisdiction over an alleged human rights violation has the opportunity to redress the allegation by its own means within the framework of its own domestic legal system. 
A state conducting domestic proceedings within its national system has the sovereign right to determine the merits of a claim and decide the appropriate remedy before there is resort to an international body. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights has remarked that the exhaustion requirement is of particular importance, quote, in the international jurisdiction of human rights because the latter reinforces or complements the domestic jurisdiction, end quote. The Commission clearly contravened Article 31 of the rules by rendering its opinion that petitioner had been denied a judicial remedy to challenge lethal injection as a method of execution while he continued to litigate that very question in the courts of the United States. Not only is the Commission's conclusion refuted by the procedural history of petitioner's case, rendering such a decision clearly prejudged a petitioner's domestic litigation and is inconsistent with the general principle of law reflected in Article 31 of the rules. Before addressing the substance of the petition, I'll address a few other procedural matters. First, we acknowledge that the Commission's requested precautionary measures in 2018 with respect to Mr. Bucklew. Specifically, the Commission requested that the United States abstain from executing Mr. Bucklew until the Commission ruled on the merits of the petition filed on his behalf. The United States notes that the Commission has since published its merits recommendations in this case, and so the United States considers the precautionary measures requested in this case to have been satisfied. The United States respectfully reiterates its long-standing view that although the Commission may make recommendations for precautionary measures, the Commission's governing instruments do not give it the authority to require that states adopt precautionary measures, as it has repeatedly claimed with regard to Mr. Bucklew and other petitions. There is no provision in the OIS Charter, the Commission statute, or even the American Convention that provides the Commission the authority to itself require any OIS member state, American Convention party or not, to take precautionary measures. As such, the Commission's request for precautionary measures can at most be a non-binding recommendation. <coughs> Regardless, the United States' actions with respect to Mr. Bucklew were not inconsistent with the precautionary measures request. Mr. Bucklew was not executed prior to the Commission's issuance of its merits report and recommendations and has not to date been executed. Consequently, the precautionary measures are moot in any event as the Commission has rendered its recommendations as contemplated in the precautionary measures. With respect to the Commission's authority beyond precautionary measures, the United States reiterates its position that there too, the Commission may only issue recommendations, not decisions that are binding on states. The relevant provisions of the OIS Charter and the Commission statute state in general terms that the Commission was created to promote the observance and defense of human rights. Article 106 of the OIS Charter and Article 1 of the Commission statute clearly established the Commission as a consultative organ of the OIS with carefully delimited responsibilities in matters of human rights. Article 18 of the Commission statute, which sets forth the general functions and powers of the Commission, and Article 20, which sets forth supplemental powers of the Commission with respect to states that are not parties to the American Convention, like the United States, also set forth powers to make recommendations, not to issue binding decisions. On a similar note, Mr. Bucklew's counsel in their letter requesting this hearing <coughs> assert that the Commission's merits report generates binding human rights obligations on the United States. It is of course true that the Commission and the Inter-American Court have long taken the view that the American Declaration is a source of legal obligation. Yet while we have great respect for the views of the Commission and of the Court, we must reiterate that the United States simply does not accept and has never accepted this view and is not bound by it as a matter of international law. Indeed, we have persistently objected to any such notion since at least the early 1980s. We also argued against it before the court in 1988 and have persistently stated our objection in scores of hearings and written submissions over the years. And with that, I will now turn the floor over to my colleague, Annalise. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Distinguished commissioners, secretary delegates, co colleagues, and friends at the other table. Again, my name is Annalise Nelson. I am also an attorney advisor at the United States Department of State. Turning to the merits of this case, we take this opportunity to reiterate that the United States respects and is committed to ensuring the right to life consistent with the obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR. We also respect the views of those, including the Commission, who advocate for the abolition of the death penalty or a moratorium on its usage. 
However, we must again emphasize that nothing in the American Declaration or in international law prohibits capital punishment for the United States in appropriate cases. Under international law, the decision whether to use or to eliminate capital punishment is left to the domestic constitutional and legal processes of individual states as long as any such penalty is imposed and carried out in a manner consistent with its international obligations. The people of the United States, both at the federal level and in the majority of our individual states, acting through their freely elected representatives, have enacted and continue to maintain laws that authorize the death penalty for the most serious crimes. Mr. Bucklew's crimes qualified as serious under the duly enacted laws of Missouri. In states that retain capital punishment, lethal injection has often been adopted as a more humane method than other methods that have been tried. Domestically, the United States judicial system provides an exhaustive system of protections at both the federal and state levels to ensure that both the application of capital punishment as well as the methods of execution are undertaken in conformity with the U.S. Constitution and with United States international legal obligations. This robust system includes protections to ensure that the execution drugs do not cause needless pain and suffering to the inmate. In this case, the petitioner has had many opportunities to challenge both his conviction for capital murder and the proposed method to be used to carry out his sentence. As we discussed earlier, the petitioner filed a petition for writ of certiorari in um, March of 2018 and an application for a stay of execution with the U.S. Supreme Court. That stay was granted, and on April 1, 2019, more than a year after the commission issued its merits report on this matter, the Supreme Court decided the case. <clears throat> Excuse me. In its 2018 merits report, the commission found that the severity of suffering that would be imposed should the, executioners, or the, the prisoner's execution be carried out could amount to torture and, as such, would violate Articles 1 and 26 of the American Declaration. Torture is defined in the U.S. Code at 18 U.S.C. 2340 as an act committed by a person acting under the color of law specifically intended to inflict se severe physical or mental pain or suffering, etc. This is consistent with the definition of torture under Article 1 of the Convention Against Torture, or the CAT, to which the United States is party which says that torture is an act by which severe pain or suffering, whether mental, physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted upon a person, etc. In its merits report, the commission found a risk of extreme suffering, the severity of which could amount to torture. However, under international law, torture is not merely rhetorical flourish. It has defined elements which cannot be satisfied in this case. Torture is a, a fact-specific determination, and the conduct at issue cannot satisfy the elements of torture because the element of intentionality is clearly lacking in this case. The risk of severe pain and suffering found by the commission, even if it did come to pass, would not to be to intentionally inflict on, on the petitioner. Petitioner does not allege that such pain and suffering would be intentionally inflicted, nor does the commission, nor could the record support such a claim. There is no evidence that the means of execution prescribed for him in this case would meet the required elements to constitute torture, and in that respect, the commission's finding is incorrect as a matter of law. I would also briefly like to address the commission's finding that petitioner's time on death row constitutes a violation of the right to humane treatment and to not receive cruel, infamous, or unusual punishment under Article 26 of the American Declaration. The U.S. appellate pr process affords those convicted of capital offenses the highest level of internationally recognized protection. The U.S. appellate process provides avenues for both state and federal court of review in every criminal conviction. In addition, federal habeas corpus procedures enable federal courts to review the substantive and procedural merits of every death penalty sentence imposed by state courts. Appellate review in the United States ensures that defendants' trials are fair and impartial and that convictions are based on substantial evidence and proportionate to the crime. It is an individual's right to take full advantage of mandatory and discretionary appeals at the state and federal level, and it is not uncommon that many years pass before this extensive appeals process is completed. 
However, when lengthy delays between the initial sentencing and the execution are caused by a capital prisoner's utilization of the many appeal avenues open to him, he cannot claim then that such a confinement during that delay are cruel, infamous, or unusual punishment. The U.S. rejects the, con the contention that the Declaration requires states to revise the conditions of detention, which may be mandated by the security risks posed by convicted prisoners on death row so that they may avoid the hardship potentially associated with a prolonged detention. Moreover, because imposition of the death penalty does not per se violate the declaration, the conditions of detention during what may be an extended delay between sentencing and execution, which exists to ensure the punishment is, is imposed fairly, follow as a consequence of lawfully imposed capital punishment. In sum, long periods of detention on death row are often the result of a constitutionally mandated exhaustive appeals process like what has taken place in this case, where Mr. Bucklew has had numerous federal and state court reviews of his case. This process ex exists to ensure the protection of other human rights recognized by the Declaration, including the right to a fair trial, the right to life, freedom from arbitrary and arrest, arrest and imprisonment, and the right to due process of law. Thank you, Annalise. And just very briefly, I want to touch on one last point, which is that the United States remains concerned that the Commission found it had confidence to review domestic court decisions in this case in spite of the fourth instance formula. The Commission has explained that under the formula that it lacks jurisdiction to substitute its judgment for that of the national courts on matters that involve the interpretation and explanation of domestic law or the evaluation of the facts. Yet it is clear that what would remain of the fourth instance formula, yet I'm sorry, it is unclear what would remain of the fourth instance formula if, as the Commission stated in its merits report in this case, the formula, quote, does not preclude the Commission from considering a case in which the petitioner's allegations entail a possible violation of any of the rights set forth in the Declaration, end quote. For states that are not parties to the American Convention on Human Rights or other treaties listed in Article 23 of the Rules of Procedure, any case must allege a possible violation of the rights set forth in the American Declaration in order for the Commission to consider it. Surely the mere fact that a petitioner properly pleaded allegations of violations of the American Declaration cannot mean that the Commission may then freely second-guess domestic courts' legal and evidentiary judgment calls. In this regard, it serves to recall that it is the Commission has set forth a materially different test and other uh, jurisprudence for determining what it may step in to second-guess domestic court decisions, namely where there is, quote, unequivocal evidence that guarantees of due process have been violated, end quote. Um, seeing that my time is up, I'll turn the floor over very briefly um, to Alexis to conclude. Thank you. Th thank you. I think I have less than one minute of a conclusion. So in our February 20, 2016 submission, we gave detailed information demonstrating that Mr. Bucklow benefited from the protections enumerated in the American Declaration through multiple layers of judicial review. As Mr. Bucklow's case demonstrates, Finding a method to carry out petitioner's sentence that is both constitutional and conforms to international law is complicated. The Supreme Court ultimately rendered its decision in this case earlier this year, a decision that we're not here to relitigate. With that, I would only reiterate that the Commission should not have intervened in this case while petitioner continued to litigate his case in the courts of the United States. The fact that the Commission issued a merits report in this case almost a year before the Supreme Court had rendered its decision on this matter underscores that irregularity. I will note that precautionary measures in this matter are moot. In its 2018 request, the Commission requested that the United States abstain from executing Mr. Bucklew until the Commission ruled on the merits of the petition filed on his behalf. Because the Commission has published its merits recommendations in this case, the United States considers the precautionary measures requested in this case to have been satisfied. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias a ambas partes por sus presentaciones. Quiero dar ahora la palabra a la comisionada Margaret May McCullough en su carácter de relatora para Estados Unidos. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I think in, in honor of transparency, I must state up front that I am diametrically, personally opposed to the death penalty on any grounds. I've always been, 
and I belong to organizations which took that position um, before entering into the inter-American system. And I just want you to know this is my personal position. As a commissioner, I act on the basis of the position um, in which is held by the commission, the principles and standards stated. Um, yes, uh, there is nothing to say that states cannot um, execute persons, uh, um, but our situation is, as I understand it, is that it must be done um, in a humane uh, manner and that the person is not in any way subjected to cruel, inhuman, or torturous uh, punishment in the course of um, meeting the sentence of the court. I, um, I do, um, I've listened to uh, avidly to your statements, which I thank you for, and to the state. And I'm not sure that I, I certainly am I'm not in agreement with your, 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 your stated position that we are acting as a, a tribunal of fourth instance. When there is an uh, allegation made to us that um, there is a violation or there is likely to be a very serious violation um, of the rights of a person or a danger that this person will be treated, treated in, in a cruel, inhuman and torturous manner, it behoves us in the execution of our mandate and competency to listen to the allegation, invite the state to also listen and respond to it. And as we're not making a finding, this is a, a hearing, um, this is not a trial, this, this is, um, and listening to your arguments, one has to say that the arguments you put forward today would have been far more effective at the merit stage of this matter. And um, today we're here to listen to the possibility of their being, of this, in, this human being, this individual, suffering cruel, inhuman, and torturous punishment. If and when, and I'm hoping it's if and not when, his execution occurs, because let's face it, the only way one can come to a conclusion about this is when the act of execution is concluded. And they were reading the media that it took him so many minutes or an hour or something, uh, um, gagging and not being able to breathe, and you read the report and you feel, geez, do I belong to the same human group as the people who put this man through this? You know, and it's, it's happened before. When people who have been executed in some state in the, these United States have taken hours to die. And, and one thing I, would, I, I must ask, is there any evidence that uh, um, um, the United States or the state, where is this man? Which state is Missouri. it? Missouri. 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 Missouri, yes, I thought it was Missouri. The state of Missouri has thought or taken steps or considered um, um, having a moratorium on death penalty. Has the State Department spoken with the, the, the government of the state government? Of, of Missouri to encourage them, perhaps, to, to effect a moratorium. You are one of the, 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 the states are increasing who are in fact abolishing the death penalty or are practicing years and years and years of moratorium. The United States, you should be the leader. And, and I, I, I really would like to know what is the 
um, State Department's position about moving towards a moratorium. I think it's well past due. And, and then into to the abolition of the death penalty. I, I really, um, I'm sorry, I'm not feeling too great at the moment. <laughs> so I, I will end my, my intervention there, if I may, Mr. President. And I thank you. I thank you, uh, Commissioner McCauley. I'll give the floor now to my colleague, uh, Commissioner Piovesan. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, thank you for providing this, this moment, I mean, to share this dramatic case and this urgent appeal uh, today. Um, I would have uh, two, one question and two comments. Uh, my concrete question um, would be about the implementation of the recommendations uh, concerning the merits report number 71 adopted in 2018 regarding the case because this is the subject matter of this public hearing to learn from the state the concrete measures adopted concerning this the recommendations that the commission um, issued in this case so this will be my question and uh, my comment would be that for the commission and we evaluate the merits of the case and the commission really uh, recognized a very uh, a, a high serious case of torture here uh, because of the method of the injection i mean the the method of the execution and the medical state of the victim so uh, it's even hard to read the lines that the the victim will explode and will be suffocated with his own blood for four minutes before dying. So if this is not torture, what would be torture? So, um, and so this is a concern of the commission. I'd like to express the concern because as all of us know, according to international human, right, human rights law, the prohibition of torture is part of use cogens. So nothing could justify nor a war, stability, emergency. There is no reason that could be, could justify a torture, a case of torture. And I would uh, endorse the voice of my dearest colleague, Margaret, um, making this appeal concerning the abolition or the, the moratorium concerning uh, the application of death penalty in the state of Missouri. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Gracias, comisionada. Voy a, voy a hablar en español porque quiero transmitir mi mensaje de una manera muy clara, lo, lo más que pueda hacerlo. No quiero entrar al tema eh, jurídico sobre la naturaleza del informe, eh, ni tampoco sobre la naturaleza jurídica de esta, de esta audiencia. Quiero resaltar, sin embargo, dos cosas muy importantes. La primera, la, eh, el, el hacer, re, re, agradecer el acercamiento que American Civil Liberties Union ha tenido con la Comisión, la confianza depositada en el trabajo de la Comisión para velar por los derechos del señor Russell eh, Bogle. Y desde luego también felicitarlos a ustedes eh, por su lucha en este y en otros casos de pena de muerte. También quiero agradecer la presencia aquí de funcionarios del Departamento de Estado. Para la Comisión es muy importante la presencia de representantes del Estado porque esta es la única manera que podemos nosotros avanzar nuestra agenda de derechos humanos en el hemisferio. Cuando podemos tener a las autoridades del Estado aquí presente y entonces entablar un diálogo. No voy a entrar al tema de la legalidad de la, de la pena de muerte. Creo que ese es un tema que ha sido discutido profundamente en este y en otros, en otros foros. En, de, también entiendo, nos queda a todos muy claros en esta mesa, la división de competencias de derecho penal en, en Estados Unidos y la competencia que tiene aquí el Estado de Missouri. Sin embargo, quiero resaltar dos cosas. 
La primera, la obligación que tiene Estados Unidos bajo el derecho internacional y bajo Jus Collins de prohibir todo acto de tortura o todo acto que signifique una pena cruel, inhumana o degradante. Y aquí hemos escuchado que Estados Unidos es vinculado a la Convención contra la, contra la Tortura, lo cual es un paso positivo, pero como bien lo acaba de expresar más recientemente eh, mi, mi colega, la comisionada Pérezán, y como escuchamos de los solicitantes, si esta condición particular ante la cual el señor Bocleo se va a enfrentar a la inyección letal no es tortura, entonces, ¿qué es tortura? Y este es el punto al que quiero llegar y la exhortación que quiero como comisión hacer para que se haga la conmutación de la pena al señor Bocleo para evitar un daño irreparable a su vida y a su integridad física y emocional por medio de la comisión de un acto que claramente va a ser tortura. No entro yo a los detalles del informe de mérito, simplemente retomo lo que ya dijo la comisión en su reciente comunicado de prensa, en el cual la comisión hizo su petición a, 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 a Estados Unidos, en particular al estado de Missouri, para que detenga la ejecución del señor Pocla. Ese es el punto que nos, que, que, este, que nos reúne aquí. Y, y yo encomio la participación que hace, el rol que juega, mejor dicho, el gobierno federal a través del Departamento de Estado por el cumplimiento de las obligaciones de derecho internacional que tiene Estados Unidos como Estado en su conjunto. Y en ese carácter apelo yo a que el... Eh, las recomendaciones de la Comisión, subrayo, las recomendaciones de la Comisión sean transmitidas al Estado de Missouri. Y, a, y agradecería mucho también la comprensión de ustedes si la Comisión se dirige por su conducto, desde luego por el canal diplomático, al Estado de, de Missouri, al gobernador del Estado de Missouri, para que ejerza sus facultades de clemencia. Entiendo que tiene como gobernador la facultad, la palabra última, de otorgar este, la clemencia. El caso es muy ejemplificativo de, de, de un posible acto de tortura y estamos en las manos últimas del gobernador del Estado de Missouri para que no sea, se, se cometa un acto inhumano. Concluyo simplemente resaltando, ya lo dijo mi colega, la comunidad Macaulay, el rol que ha jugado Estados Unidos en el hemisferio en avanzar una agenda de derechos humanos centrada en la persona. Este caso no puede ser la excepción y la Comisión apela a la comprensión del gobierno federal, pero también del gobierno de Estado de Missouri. Últimas siete minutos para cada una de las partes, si me permiten. Tiene la palabra usted. Can we just take 20 seconds to organize our response? Thank you for, uh, for your questions and for your comments and for uh, urging um, Governor Parson to do the right thing. We, we totally agree with you that this is not a matter of uh, academically debating what are the severe infliction of uh, pain or suffering, whether it's physical or mental, uh, that we're talking about here. 
we're talking about a particular case and a circumstance where uh, there's a no, no doubt that, Ms. that Bucklew will be and most certainly would be in a position that would be in the circumstances that were created, whether it's through the lethal injection of the Missouri state or through the, the fact that the, the, government, the government has uh, pushed forward or mo wants to mo move forward with execution uh, disregarding all the, the history of what happened in the state and what happened in other states as well. In fact, this particular case, this petition was brought before the commission in two, on behalf of two individuals, uh, Charles Warner and Mr. Russell Bucklew in 2014. We all remember the gruesome botched execution of Mr. Warner went through in 2014. Do we really want to see that happening again and, and say that we did everything? Can the state of Missouri and the state, the government, the federal government can say that they did everything in their power to prevent a botched execution, which we know that it is coming. It is preventable. That's why we think that it's not an academic exercise of what's the definition of torture, which I am I'm happy that the government is recognizing, for maybe for the first time, uh, that the ICCPR and the CAT are relevant to this discussion. Normally what we get from the government is that you should not be discussing any international legal obligations outside the American Declaration. Uh, and I'm happy that the government is putting forward these, doc, uh, these arguments, because we agree that the CAT and the ICCPR are relevant and applicable to the situation as well. Now, if, if we're talking about uh, the definition of torture, it's not just Article 1 of CAT. There's also Article 16, and there's also Article 7 to the ICCPR. The prevention of... Uh, ICCPR specifically talks about the whole uh, torture, cruel, inhumane, degrading treatment. The separation here that the government is trying to make and particularly sticking to the issue of infliction, of intentional infliction, as if we are now going into the mens rea, as if, as if we are now investigating the crime of torture. We are not trying here to investigate a crime of torture. We're trying to prevent the crime of torture from taking place. And so what I, what I wanted to stress is that as a matter of law, as a matter of policy, uh, the U.S. government, the federal government, as well as the state of Missouri have the the obligations to prevent uh, the act of torture and the botch executions that's happening. This, as, as was said by the commissioners, is the only way to do it is through clemency. And so that's why we have appealed to Governor Parson. And as I said, nearly 60,000 uh, citizens, including people from Missouri, who are opposed to the death penalty, said that, save us. This is not good for the state of Missouri. This is not for us. This is not who we are. We should not allow a torturous execution happening in 2019 when we know that this is not the right thing to do. Uh, with that, I would want to turn to my colleagues to say other, to add other points as well. It's worth noting that at, as we sit here today, just days away from Russell Bucklew's proposed torturous execution, we're at a time when the United States has increasingly turned from the death penalty. While once the vast majority of states in the United States embrace the death penalty, today 25 states would not allow an execution, execution to go forward. Certainly part of that is because of the many failures of the administration and the fairness, the discrimination, the failure to protect the innocent. But one part of that problem has been with what we've seen in increasing failures of botched executions. In the context of lethal injection, usually it's about the risk that the protocol will fail. The protocol will not go as planned. But we're here today because the state of Missouri has not has so far failed to stop a, an execution that if it goes forward as everyone believes it will, will result in the torture of a human being. No state has ever done so. And I, I respectfully disagree that this is complicated. This is a very clear and obvious solution to this problem. The governor of Missouri can and should grant clemency. Russell Bucklew has a degenerative, painful medical condition. He will spend the rest of his days in pain in the Mississippi State Penitentiary, in the Missouri State Penitentiary. The only question is whether the state of Missouri will go forward with an execution that it knows will result in the excruciating pain. As the commission has noted, many of the, the, the disagreements about 
um, when this discussion should have happened were appropriate earlier stages, not, not now when we are on the eve of the execution, but in some ways that, that goes to the bigger issue of how and when these claims can be raised, given that election, the execution protocols are, are often in place, are often changing and not in place until the end, and there's very little opportunity to timely raise them and litigate them. Mr. Bucklew brought this case to the commission in, in 2014 and has been seeking the, the ruling since then. We ask that the governor of Missouri <coughs> do the only thing to ensure that the state of Missouri and the United States do not sanction an execution in violation of international law. Thank you very much. Uh, last seven minutes for the, the state. I'll just start out very briefly to say that uh, I wanted to clarify and to emphasize that we've already forwarded the recommendations of the commission to the state of Missouri. That has been done. Um, uh, I'll leave now the, my colleagues from the legal division. Thank you very much. Um, and to, to respond to the distinguished commissioner's question about the moratorium, um, as I stated earlier, uh, the United States respects that there are those in the international forum, including this commission, who have strong views on the abolition or moratorium on the use of the death penalty. And the United States does not share that view, but it's, it's a helpful conversation to have. And as I articulated, in the United States, the, um, we believe that, that, um, that the, the democratically represented elected representatives that represent the people of the United States make the decision um, at the federal and at the state level. As our friends at the other table have noted, there's some heterogeneity among states on this issue. But um, on your specific question, um, we, we have not spoken with the state of Missouri on this issue. Thank you. Thank you again for your questions. And I'll just try to respond briefly to a number of them, um, particularly focusing uh, first on the recommendations in the merits report, um, beginning with the second, but it also ties into the first one. It's the question of um, access to judicial remedies and the denial thereof and what steps have been taken to address that. And I just want to uh, return to the relevant provisions of the American Declaration, um, which distinguishes between access to a remedy and, and the outcome of such a remedy. Um, I begin with Article 18 of the American Declaration, which provides that, quote, every person may resort to the courts to ensure respect for his legal rights. There should likewise be available to him a simple, brief procedure whereby the courts will protect him from acts of authority that, to his prejudice, violate any fundamental right. And Article 24, which provides that, quote, every person has the right to submit respectful petitions to any competent authority for reasons of either general or private interest and the right to obtain a prompt decision thereon, end quote. And so the second recommendation is premised on the finding that the petitioner was, and quoting again, denied a judicial remedy to challenge lethal injection as a method of execution. However, it's the outcome of precisely such a judicial remedy that petitioners are contesting today. So the fact that we are discussing the outcome of that remedy necessarily means that petitioner was, one, able to resort to the courts within the meaning of Article 18, and two, able to petition competent authorities within the meaning of Article 24. What Articles 18 and 24 do not purport to guarantee, though, is a particular outcome, and nor could they. Um, indeed, the Commission has reiterated that, and I'll quote here, the Commission um, said, the fact that the outcome of a domestic proceeding was unfavorable does not constitute a violation, end quote. And that's at paragraph 58 of the Commission's 2007 Manzilla versus Mexico inadmissibility report, which is quoting another one of the Commission's reports. So according to the Commission's practice, the American Declaration recognizes an individual's ability to access judicial remedies, but it does not preordain the outcome of such remedies. Petitioner was able to challenge lethal injection as a method of execution in U.S. courts. And moreover, in this particular case, the highest court of the United States ultimately reviewed his challenge. So the fact that petitioner did not prevail in his challenge before U.S. courts does not mean that he was denied access to judicial remedies within the meaning of Articles 18 and 24 of the American Declaration. And as a result, our legal system already implements the recommendations included in the report. 
Um, and I'll also address briefly the, the torture point. Um, a number of the distinguished commissioners raised the status of the prohibition of torture under international law, and I don't think there's any question about that, although I would also like to note that, as Annalise mentioned before, um, the CAT does remain beyond the competence of the commission. Uh, but the fact remains that the critical distinction here is that the risk of pain incidental to a method of execution does not mean that a method of execution is being utilized with the specific intent to cause such pain. And that element of specific intent, um, whether it's referred to as mens rea or not, is part of the definition of torture under international law. Now, in the United States, the Eighth Amendment governs how capital punishment can be carried out, and the Supreme Court has explained that the Eighth Amendment prohibits cruel and unusual methods that super add terror, pain, or disgrace. The Supreme Court has held that cruelty implies something inhuman and barbarous, something more than the mere ex extinguishment of life. And this interpretation of the Eighth Amendment is consistent with the definition of torture at 18 U.S.C. 2340, again, as an act committed by a person acting under the color of law specifically intended to inflict severe physical or mental pain or suffering. This is, again, consistent with the CAT. In other words, the Eighth Amendment prohibits methods of punishment that intentionally inflict or super add <coughs> terror, pain, or disgrace. So here, while the allegation is that there is a risk of severe pain, there is no allegation that such pain is being intentionally inflicted by the state of Missouri. Consequently, the risk of severe pain antecedent to a method of execution cannot be equated with an intent to inflict such pain, and as such, the method of execution just cannot be characterized as torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. And I'm relieved to hear that I think on both sides there's agreement that that element of intentionality is lacking here. And with that, I think I've addressed um, all of your questions. So I'll thank you again for the opportunity to appear before the commission. Thank you. And we, we, we thank you. With this, we come to an end of the hearing. I want to really appreciate the participation of both parties. This is a subject matter that the commission will continue uh, following up. Uh, we will continue uh, reiterating our, our uh, request of a state of the e execution. We hope for the, for the best, and I, I really appreciate the trust that you have uh, given to the, to, the, to the commission and your participation. This hearing was uh, conducted in a very responsible, serious, but also uh, very sensitive manner. So thank you. Uh, have a good afternoon. The hearing comes to an end.